Hello and welcome to the Hindu. I am Priyali Prakash and you're watching Tipping Point, our weekly show that examines climate change events and the trends shaping our future. In today's episode, we'll be exploring a topic that has stirred much debate at COP29, carbon markets and the controversy surrounding them. COP29 is currently taking place in Baku, Azerbaijan. This global climate conference usually sees participation from world leaders, yet this year, some major figures like US President Joe Biden, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and China's President Xi Jinping have been notably absent. On the first day of COP29, an agreement was reached to establish a UN-managed global carbon market to trade carbon credits, a step that marks significant progress. As we discussed in a previous Tipping Point episode, Carbon markets are a key tool in climate policy arsenal, aiming to incentivize carbon reduction by allowing trading of emission credits. Based on the President's board and inclusive consultations, I trust that this proposal is acceptable for all. I now invite the CMA to adopt the draft decision contained in document PA-CMA-2024-L.1. Thank you. Ahead of COP29, a supervisory body under the Paris Agreement had already set standards for a new UN crediting mechanism. The COP29 delegates welcomed these recommendations, yet there's still a long road ahead as nations work to finalize all aspects of this global market. To unpack this further, we spoke with Kritika Ravi Shankar, a senior analyst at C Step. It's useful to compare it to how negotiations went in the past. So uh, the Paris Agreement came into force in 2015 and so Article 6, which lays out the foundation for the establishment of a global carbon market, came into effect. And since then, it's been really difficult to get the conference of parties to agree on guidelines that will um, help run the carbon market or help operationalize it. And so um, what has happened this time and how they were able to get to a consensus this time is the supervisory body that was like, created um, under the Arti- under Article 6 to come up with a set of standards, which is right now what they've released is basically like the rules to make the rules for the carbon market. So um, what they've done is come up with the standards and just kind of skipped past the phase where the conference of parties can go through the scrutinize the text and you know negotiate if they want to change how something is worded because um i'm sure i don't know if you remember a couple of cops ago they had um the whole thing was derailed because of like one phrase about coal phase down and phase out so um language makes a lot of difference in these negotiations so <clears throat> They've they've basically bypassed that um, negotiate like the whole scrutiny phase and uh, just adopted the standards and then said okay now if you guys want to discuss something we can discuss you know we can discuss specific parts of it but they're not really going to budge on the foundations of doing it this way has its merits but it also um, a lot of people say sets the precedent for um, lots of uh, other things to be passed this way without any um, kind of discussion amongst stakeholders. And that could be a problem because one of the key uh, drawbacks of this whole thing is that what they've passed might not even be strict enough or stringent enough to help uh, run a very like a, an effective carbon market. According to COP29 organizers, a well-implemented global carbon market could reduce the cost of meeting national climate goals by up to $250 billion annually by fostering international cooperation. However, the details of how this would unfold remain vague. Critics argue that carbon markets may open door to loopholes, letting high emission countries pay to offset rather than reduce their emissions directly. Kritika shared insights into these critiques and the challenges that come with balancing ambition with accountability in the global carbon market framework. The main criticism is that everything was passed essentially with no negotiation. Um, but the other criticisms have to do with what is actually in the text and um, and that's because the the 
guidelines for a global carbon market in the Paris Agreement as it stands now is very similar to the the way that the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol was formed. So, um, and that there is more or less a consensus that the CDM did not achieve the emissions reduction that it was meant to. And that is for a few different reasons that, so they, those um, problems are not yet addressed in the document that has come out at COP29 as of now, but there is potential to address that when they actually come up with the detailed um, rules and regulations. Under the clean development mechanism, I'm going to call it CDM, uh, developed countries were allowed to invest in mitigation projects in developing countries because developed countries had these emissions reduction targets that they had to achieve. So, um, and m mitigation projects in developing countries are just generally cheaper. So, if they invest in those uh, developing countries, then they generate credits for the emissions that are reduced by that by those projects, and then they can use those credits to claim uh, that they have gotten one step closer to achieving their um, uh, emissions reduction target. So <clears throat> the issue with the CDM was that um, the way that they allowed or the way that they assessed projects for their emissions reduction potential was um, not stringent enough. So a lot of the projects that did generate credits under the CDM were projects that were that would have happened anyway. So. It, it, they were projects that were essentially part of the business as usual trajectory of these developing countries. So uh, they were inexpensive enough, the developing countries had the resources and there was no, um, there was really no additional benefit to having the carbon credit mechanism there to help, um, dry, uh, to, to help direct finance towards these projects. So because of that, there was an oversupply of credits and the, um, so on paper, it looks like you've mitigated a lot, but then you haven't really because that most of that mitigation would have happened anyway. So that is one of the key problems with the CDM. And <clears throat> another one, uh, another problem that yeah, is also relevant to both the CDM and the, um, the, carbon, the Paris Agreement carbon market is that is what's called the reversal risk, which is uh, basically um, if there is a let's say a forestation project that is that removes carbon from the atmosphere then that um and at some point in the future that land that has been afforested has it, the land use change happens so maybe it's deforested for some kind of development reason maybe it's you know there's a wildfire or something so the carbon that has been removed from the atmosphere and stored in that land is released again so how you would account for the carbon that was removed from the atmosphere because of the project and the carbon that's released again because the land has the land use change uh, happened is not something that's addressed in the document or in the CDM either. So that is um, something that uh, to keep in mind and that really should be a focus when they're out like uh, when they're detailing out the um, regulations for the carbon market. Um, and finally, something that I think is not spoken about enough um, is <clears throat> it, it relates to the broader goal of having developed countries commit to providing climate finance to developing countries. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure you know that um, in the past, up to 2020 initially, uh, developed countries had to um, provide developing countries with $100 billion um, per year of finance. and most of this was supposed to be grants and um, you know low or no interest loans um, and essentially you know finance that would not create additional debt obligations for the, devel the developing countries who are receiving them and this is something that india and other de developing countries have constantly um, you know pushed for that that a larger part of this finance has to be grants but um, developed countries have constantly fallen short of the goal itself of the amount and also have most of the finance has been uh, loans. Yeah, so in the NCUGs, they, um, India and other countries have uh, proposed that the target should now be $1 trillion per year. Um, <clears throat> so the reason I bring that up is because um, in the context of the global carbon market being, um, you know, more well on its way to being operationalized um the developed countries 
have the opportunity to um, count the the investments they make for credits as uh, towards their obligation towards their climate finance obligation, and that is a problem because uh, it's not meant to be an investment opportunity for them. Like profitability is not the goal, and it kind of goes against the common but differentiated responsibility and respective capability principle of the Paris Agreement. Here's what Federica Bieta, the managing director for the Coalition for Rainforest Nations, has to say about this. That yes. was the issue, right? Yes. Because in theory, decisions are taken at the end. You, the supervisory body would have to present uh, what they had agreed and recommend uh, to the COP but for ag agreement after two weeks of discussions, right? If the 200 party participated under the COP, they would agree their question. Instead of the presidency trying to preempt these discussions, and there was a lot of discomfort from many parties, including us, uh, to approve something that we didn't have the time to discuss with other parties. Though the presidency wanted to really start off uh, with a positive signal, given the failure of markets in Dubai, and uh, we try to, you know, to work with them and uh, and for this time we say, hey, we can accept it. It should not be repeated in the future. But the procedural way how the supervisory body reach those uh, adoptions and uh, also how the presidency, you know, push it through on day one, because party needs to have the time to discuss that. Adding to the tensions, U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has threatened to withdraw from the Paris Agreement once again. Known for his stance against climate science, Trump has pledged to increase fossil fuel production, a move that runs counter to global efforts to curb emissions. Additionally, Argentina recently exited the negotiations. President of the country Javier Milei, who is a climate change skeptic, has called global warming a hoax in the past. These developments cast a shadow over COP29 and the hard-won progress on climate action. A recent report by the Center for Science and Environment, along with Down to Earth, paints a stark picture of India's vulnerability to extreme weather. Between January and September 2024, India experienced extreme weather on a staggering 93% of the days impacting 35 out of the 36 states and union territories. The report documented over 3,000 deaths linked to these events, with 210 from heat waves alone and more than 1,000 fatalities due to flooding. Crop damage was extensive, affecting over 3.2 million hectares, while more than 200,000 homes were destroyed, a toll that may still be underestimated due to incomplete data. Madhya Pradesh emerged as the most affected state logging the highest number of extreme weather days, while Kerala witnessed the largest death toll. Record-breaking climate patterns were observed, including the Southern Peninsula's fourth warmest January since 1901, and a monsoon season marked by severe uninterrupted weather impacts across all 122 days. Assam, Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh bore most of the brunt of the damage in the monsoon season. This pattern aligns with scientific predictions of more frequent and intense weather events as climate change worsens. Let's close today's episode on a hopeful note. In Bali, Indonesia, two sisters, Milati and Isabel Wisjun, are proving that individuals can make a huge difference in the fight against pollution. In 2013, at just 12 and 10 years old, Milati and Isabel founded Bye Bye Plastic Bags, a grassroots movement dedicated to reducing single-use plastics on their home island. We spoke to Milati about Bye Bye Plastic Bags at the Smart Cities Expo World Congress in Barcelona earlier this month. Hey, my name is Milati Weissen. I'm a full-time change maker and the founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags. 10 years ago, or a little bit more than 10 years ago, when I was 10 and 12 years old, together with my younger sister, we created the organization called Bye Bye Plastic Bags. And we campaigned as a youth-led organization, um, building momentum in our communities, working with a lot of local authorities, and finally, together with the help of so many organizations, and individuals, Bali implemented the ban on single-use plastic bags, straws, and styrofoam. So it shows that people change is possible, but the work is far from over because implementation is key and we need to start seeing 
promises or policy being translated to real action on the ground. So there's still a lot of work to do and I hope that everybody joins the movement for change. In 2019, six years after launching their campaign, Bali implemented a ban on single-use plastics, a landmark achievement for the movement. Bye Bye Plastic Bags has since grown into an international campaign with over 50 teams worldwide, including chapters in India in cities like Bhoj, Pune and Hyderabad. Thank you for watching this episode of Tipping Point. If you found this discussion insightful, don't forget to subscribe to The Hindu for more updates and in-depth climate coverage.